This is an amazing turnout. I'm super, super impressed and excited to see all of you. Thank you very much for coming out. I hope you don't mind me like immediately interrupting you. <laughs> uh, no, Interrupt no, no. away. We're here to hear you talk, not me. So. Okay, your turn. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, as Ali said, we're super excited to have you here. And thank you for coming in, sharing a bit of knowledge with our team and with people here in Saskatoon across the city. Um, I think a lot of people here are very familiar with Dropbox and Google and uh, a few of the places that you have worked. Uh, you've had a great career so far, but I was hoping that to kick things off, you could tell us a bit more uh, about the businesses you've co-founded, the one that you're working at now, or, or a business that um, you ended up selling to Dropbox as well. So can you give us a little insight into what you do there and what those businesses do as well? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let me, um, I'll give you sort of the the 30 second overview on me because uh, my hope with this is this could be like collaborative we've we've got questions beforehand but like interrupt at any point that sort of thing um so i've been down in san francisco now for a little bit over a decade and i've worked at a combination of you know the big names um in a product management role and then started a couple of my own companies and uh so i'm on company number two now we are a grand total of four people. So you guys are absolutely crushing me in terms of actually building and growing amazing teams. Actually, you're right now a lot closer to my experience at Dropbox. I joined Dropbox in 2012 when they were about 130 people. And I understand you're like just crossed 100. I think we're pretty close to 130 now. All right, so you're basically at Dropbox Woo! stage when I joined Dropbox, so congratulations. That's amazing. That's like um, the vast majority of companies that I work with that are based in San Francisco don't get to the phase that you're at right now. So you should all be really, really excited about that. So um, yeah, I'm still at the, uh, oh crap, this isn't working yet phase of startup uh, journey uh, for me personally. At Census, what we do is uh, work with sales operations teams to try and help their sales customer go to market work in sort of a more automated way. So we work with a lot of the other companies in San Francisco. We've talked with a few of you folks over over the last couple of months as well about maybe maybe being a customer. I'm just here to sell all of you on my product. That's actually the, the whole purpose of this thing. But anyway, yeah, so um, I've been in San Francisco for about a decade, um, working at some of the big companies. And then, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of what I do now in my sort of spare time is also work with the Canadian ecosystem. Um, Canadian founders based in the US, Canadian founders across Canada. And so uh, I think we're going to get into a little bit of that today, but um, I have some, some pointers and nefarious reasons for being here that I want to share. So yeah, that's uh, great too. You did spend a fair amount of your career at Dropbox and Google as well. And I think um, you've mentioned the parallels between Dropbox and the growth that you experienced while you work there and the growth that we're experiencing here at Seven Shifts right now. And by experiencing, I say managing and dealing with and struggling through and um, loving at the same time, having a lot of opportunity there um, through that experience. But can you give us some insight into what products or roles or divisions that you worked at um, when you worked at Google and Dropbox and some insight into your role there too? Sure. Yeah. So um, I joined Google back in 2008. And uh, at that point, Google was like a, you know, 20,000 person company. Um, and actually, when I joined, I was like, okay, well, it, it's, it's, you know, that's as big as it's going to get. That's peaked. I was totally way wrong. It's like a, you know, 150,000 people now. It's giant. Um, my role, most of my time at Google was really on there, like, platforms and partnerships, so working with their developer ecosystem. Uh, and so then when I joined Dropbox, that was also what I was working on, was sort of the developer API side of the world. And by virtue of Dropbox being a rapidly growing company with a very small PM team, I ended up working on pretty much everything else. So Dropbox for business, which was our sort of like, take the, you know, your photo sharing experience and give it to companies. Uh, our marketing team working with growth, all that sort of stuff. So um, I'm sure you're starting to experience that now when you have a, a lot of things that you want to do and not quite enough people to work on them. Yeah, Ali uh, said two minutes ago she didn't know my title, but I don't know if many people in the organization really do. <laughs> I feel like I've been on a similar trajectory here at Seven Shifts, so great. 
Um, <laughs> you've worked in a lot of organizations at different phases of their growth or different stages. You're starting your own. You sold a company. Um, so what do you find challenging or interesting about making that drastic shift from working at such a large organization or organization that's rapidly scaling to one that you're trying to emulate similar growth at. It must be a big change or a big shift in focus or mindset for you to jump from a Dropbox or a Google back to your own organization. Yeah, it's um, uh, it's it's definitely humbling. I mean, the most amazing thing about uh, uh, working in an organization of this size is that you have teammates. You have people that can help you out. And so when you're a two-person company, um, nothing gets done if you're not doing anything. Uh, so you have this tremendous internal pressure to like, oh crap, we really need to build this feature or we haven't updated the page yet. Like there's just no progress that gets made. So when I went from uh, the first con company back into Dropbox, suddenly I worked with a team again and I'm like, oh wow, we're getting all this shit done. This is so much more productive. And it, like, it's that that I missed that's one of my favorite things about working at a company this size. Like you are, you're at this point where you can kind of know everybody else. Like maybe you're starting to get to a phase where people are joining so quick now that you don't know everybody's name. That's maybe just starting to sneak in along the edges. But in theory, you know everybody, you know what they do, you know their contribution to the team and you're all pulling together. and. That doesn't happen on both sides of it. So on the small company, like you end up with two people and you're all trying to do things and you're doing a really bad job of it. And at a big company, like tens of thousands of people, you end up in a world where there's kind of technically not enough good things to be working on. And so you end up with like managers that are bickering and fighting and like trying to do like political processes and that sort of thing. And I hate that too. But the phase that you're at right now is like, that's the sweet spot in terms of companies. You are all working together to actually like get things done. You have the opportunity to like learn, uh, grow into new roles, but also like your impact is super, super tangible. You can see it in your customers. You can see it when you ship a feature. And that's just not the case at like a company like Google. Like I turned on a little tiny thing in the back end and nobody will notice, even though it's in impacting a lot of users, like yeah, it just doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. It's not the like thing that they're talking about on stage. It's not at an event. So. Didn't release something and light up the entire CS department for two weeks. Or delete the servers. <laughs> Impact <by accident>. goes <laughs> in both directions. <laughs> I'll tell you that story later. <laughs> um, I think that's a good segue into the next topic that we wanted to discuss here. So you talked about being... Um, you know, in companies that contrast the stage of growth that we're at right now and uh, enjoying the phase of growth that we're at because we have so many people that can show or have an impact on the product that we ship and what we do here as a company. Uh, so when we surveyed the company, there were a lot of questions about managing product and managing product managers. So my question to you is what strategies or processes uh, have you used or what did you do or implement in the organizations that you worked in to help scale product and research and development organizations uh, and to make sure that everyone's on the same page and kind of working in the same direction that you mentioned is such a benefit of a company of our size right now? Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because there's not really, there's not a right answer here, right? Like in many ways, what you are doing now uh, as a company, both in terms of product management and then just sort of cultural in general, is defining the ways in which your organization sucks. And that's the benefit. You get to you get to choose the ways that it sucks, but it's there will there's no perfect answer. There's no like, oh, if we do this, then all the problems go away and this just goes swimmingly. Like everything is always a trade-off in terms of product management. So um, just to like give you a concrete example, uh, Facebook's sort of motto or one of their values is uh, move fast and break things. And that is totally legitimate way of running a company. It states the way in which it sucks right there in, in the value, it, things break. Dropbox, we were sweat the details. And it's, that's that sounds great, but that it's the inverse problem of, well, okay, things are gonna take time and we don't want to break things. But that means that we're not being as productive, we're not moving as fast, we're not shipping as many things. And so what you get to do right now is be conscious about, hey, these are the trade-offs that we are going to make 
as a company. This is going to show up in how we treat our customers. This is going to show up in how we make decisions about what products to ship, what features to build. And that is, that piece, I don't know. I don't know what, is, is this explicit at this point? Do you talk about like values when you're hiring people? Uh, is that a thing that, that comes up? <laughs> I'm staring at Mackenzie, our HR manager here, who's like nodding her head like crazy. <laughs> but yeah, we, we live and breathe by our core values and we hire based on those values too. So that's, um, I think one of the things that I learned at Dropbox is that uh, you will get, especially because you're here now, um, you're gonna get really frustrated with like, I feel like I'm just repeating myself constantly. And like, that's that's your job now. Like you you, you grew by 10% last week when you uh, hired a bunch of people in, in Toronto. Like that, you are now growing at such a clip that like you are the bearers of your company's values going forward. And so you are going to constantly be repeating yourself. And that's actually one of the most important things you can do in terms of making sure that those values are recognized and that like everybody understands these are the trade-offs that you're making and these are the ways that if you don't mind me saying seven shift sucks I, I'm, I'm saying for just in terms of organizationally like it just no it, one's it, offended it, yes no okay uh, i just mean in terms of like these are the the trade-offs that we've made because we think this is the right thing for the company and this is what we stand by yeah that makes sense so we've been spending a lot of time as a product team trying to iron out our process and figure out how we want new product managers to operate and what mindset they should be in and what values we, I guess, give down to them or, or um, portray to them about how we want to operate and how we make things suck less, I guess, overall is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and I was reading an article that you published a while ago, it might have been from like 2012, talking about your experience uh, at Dropbox. And the I think it was titled The Best Thing That They Did to Scale Product Management Organizations. So I've read it, but I don't think everyone here has. So can you give us a, a bit of a Coles Notes version about that? Sure, yeah. Um, so the interesting sort of context there is, uh, so yeah, Dropbox, I joined 2012, 2013, 20, we, we sort of did the thing that was in that, that blog post. And um, the company at the time, we had a PM team of about five people. So I was the, we were sort of scaling that. Yeah, it, yes, this sounds familiar. <laughs> um, and largely what we were trying to do as a product management team was sort of scale both uh, our founders, because they were involved in a lot of the decision-making process of what should be prioritized, what features, but also then let's sort of like capture our values in terms of uh, these are the features that we want to ship. This is what success looks like. This is what it means to be proud of the types of things. Um, we had done a very bad job of um, sort of capturing a process by which we made those decisions. And so as a result, like basically end of 2013, we had doubled the PM size. We definitely more than doubled the engineering team, but we hadn't changed the fact that like Drew and Arash were still in the decision-making process. And so their scope had suddenly gone from like before my time, you know, 30, 40 people to 100, 150, 200 people all working on the different product and they were approaching it the same way. So a lot of what we were doing was trying to just create a process by which we could organize the entire team. And so that was like breaking out the decision-making process and being very clear about, hey, this this project is at this phase. It's brand new. The things that we need to talk about are like, what are the motivations? What does success look like here? Why are we doing this in the first place? Less of the like, hey, these are the pixels. This is the feature. This is the solution. Like there was What's a lot the name? of- name? What's that copy? Yeah, exactly. Like it's very easy to get to the like, hey, no, I don't like the logo that you designed here. And like, well, that's not, we're, we're still talking about whether we should build this or not. That's the completely wrong level of fundamental. And so um, getting to a framework where we could sort of stage things out and then having the entire company understand that framework, not just the product and engineering side, but also like, marketing so they know this is when I should tag in actually this is a brand new it doesn't need any help yet or this is when it's going to start impacting sales this is when customer success should should plan for it like having a planning structure that everybody got to understand is really 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 important there but I think that the, like, the other meta piece is because you are growing I mean doubling you know every six to twelve months whatever process you come up with is going to break like it's it just by definition, it's going to break. You're going to have to retool it because it's not going to be built for the scale that you're at in six, 12, 18 months. And so there's, it's very easy to kind of get into a world where you're like, 
this is the right process and we finally figured it out. And the reality is, is like, that's never going to happen. Like you're going to have something that works and then that fire will be not the hot, hottest burning fire and you'll move on to another hotter burning fire. Oh, wow, this is surprisingly appropriate. Thank you for the visual. Um, and, and that's great. That's the right way to prioritize things. And then six, 12 months down the line, that's going to break again. And that didn't mean that you screwed something up or you didn't think about the future. Like if you hadn't done those trade-offs in the first place, you may not have even got there. So I think the most important part of that for me is, um, especially in this like hyper growth phase that you're at, you have to be okay with just change. You are, you're going to have a process. It's going to help you move faster. And then you're going to tweak and tool that process over time. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. We've been going through a lot of that here lately. And when we started 2019 and mixing my years up and thinking I'm getting ahead of myself, I think we had like two or three people working in product and quickly jumped to six and pretty soon we'll be at 10. And I think we've done that a couple times over the last few months where we're like, this process is a dumpster fire. We're going to throw it away and start again. So that's, that's okay. <laughs> Very that's, relevant. That's, that's part of the, part of the experience. Yeah. So. Um, we've mentioned or talked a lot about our growth here as a company at Seven Shifts. Um, you've been through similar rapid growth at other organizations. Were there any big surprises or things that kind of shocked you that you ran into, problems that you didn't think would have been problems when you're running through that growth that you can share with our team here to help us better prepare for the future? Uh, I'm glad you're ahead of things on the values because we were not. Uh, we were we were really not. Um, we thought we were like Drew and Arash and, and sort of the OG team uh, thought they had a handle on like here are the company values this is what's important but the thing that we weren't doing at that point was just that re repetition like making that something that everybody understood and that showed up in like our prioritization process and showed up with the board it wasn't something that we had sort of encoded in such a way that everybody understood it and we were telling it over and over again and so as a result like we were hiring so quickly uh, and we were hiring from, you know, Facebook and hiring from Google and not telling that story that they were coming in with their own culture. So the Facebook people were coming in with the move fast break things. And that was like, obviously not how Dropbox is built. And Google people were like, well, let's just build the most crazy complex, like Google nerdy PhD solution to this. And like, oh, well, that's probably going to take us a long time. Let's not do that either. And they would have like literal yelling matches about what is the right thing in planning meetings and they were not wrong like these weren't bad people they weren't you know posturing or anything like that it was just a like we had done a poor job of telling them this is what's important at dropbox yeah like this is how we make decisions yeah exactly make it that way. this is this is what success looks like and what we value and so um yeah i, I know I've, now i'm repeating myself but uh i think that's that was one of the things that like just caught me off guard the plus side of that is um there are parts of a culture that maybe you don't want as you scale and the benefit is as long as you're thoughtful about that you don't actually have to wait that long before you can get rid of them so um uh by our own admission i think we were kind of a bro -y culture like it was a it was a culture that came out of um uh MIT basically like college dropouts and sort of technical term bro -y, right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um and that had a certain amount of sort of like cultural aspects to it that were okay and there were some bad parts of that as well and there was something that like especially as we grew we didn't want to have included as part of our story and the benefit of you know growing really quickly is if you just wait six months 50 percent of the people will have no experience with that whatsoever and will not remember that that's part of the culture so either you can you can kind of tweak in both directions on that Right, makes sense. Okay, so one thing that we have struggled with here as a company at Seven Shifts is planning projects that cross many different development teams or many different products or lanes. So we've chatted a lot about um, you know, how to scale up a department and how to grow, but I wanted to see if you had any tips for our teams um, as we have scaled up and grown from five to 11 development teams. We've We've struggled with that a little bit, you know. I have a priority backlog or sequence, and I have goals that I'm fighting towards, and uh, we're trying to create a structure that aligns common teams around common goals. But um, yeah, have you experienced any issues with that? Do you have any tips for our organization <laughs> about how to manage products across different product managers or across different development teams? 
Uh, yes, I've experienced pains with that. That's uh, I think we all have. <laughs> um, okay, well, let me ask you a question then. So, how are you sure. organized right now? Like, how do you organize teams? How are they grouped? How do you prioritize? Yeah, so we have different domains or code boundaries, and each team is in charge of a set amount of domain or code boundaries. Um, with this recent round of growth, growth, sorry, we've tried to organize boundaries that have a lot of work that crosses different teams under senior product managers and designers so that they can make the call um, as to the priority of resources or projects that cross multiple teams. But uh, we'll still have a lot of things just given the nature of our product and our code base that cross all teams and span the entire company. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about product-led growth and about how we price our product, but we're embarking on a journey here to break down features further and assign them to new plans and try to drive um, you know, upsells and expansion revenue across those plans. So that's one example of something that's particularly challenging for us. Sure. Uh, we're planning it as a company. One person is leading that charge, but it will touch every team and go into every team's backlog and then get prioritized as such. Um, as a company, we set goals for the quarter. Um, we call them rocks. We work on EOS. It's an entrepreneurial operating system. And then the teams are in charge of prioritizing a backlog um, based on those rocks that will help drive the company toward that shared vision or those shared KPIs or metrics. Cool. So that's where things get interesting sometimes because we do have different lanes or backlogs per PM or per development team. Uh, and prioritizing across those is sometimes a challenge. Yeah. Hey, I mean... One of the hardest parts is, I mean, you're still going to be resource constrained. You're going to be resource constrained for a while. And so you're going to be making trade-offs uh, in terms of what these teams are. But in, in general, I'm a big believer in cross-functional teams where you have product and engineering and 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 whatever the right other set of resources are uh, working together. Because the more that you end up in a world where your team depends on some external dependency to even if it's just approve but like you know add some deliverable the more that you end up in a well now we're waiting for that and it's their fault and you end up in a finger pointing type of situation right so the 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 more that you can sort of build that team around um, the set of constituents could, that can just move with autonomy, the more that they can be empowered to make the right decisions for themselves and they don't have to go back and coordinate with the rest of the team. Now, that um, that has trade-offs and the, the makeup of that team is different as a function of the company. So for, for example, Google was, every team is engineering led and product management supports engineering and like, at least when I was there, like design was sort of a thing that that kind of helped occasionally, uh, and we never saw sales or marketing. Like that was just not a that was not a, uh, a constituent. At Dropbox, design was much more important. So design and product and engineering, like the the organization was called EPD for engineering, product, and design. Like that was literally that that uh, triplet working together at, at times. And then you look at like companies like Uber or Lyft, and they're a lot more sort of operational. And so their PM looks more like a McKinsey type of analyst, and they have more actual data folks on their team working with engineering, a little less design. So it's sort of a, okay, well, what does that functional repeatable unit of like, you know, SWAT team look like here? And does that include something beyond product manager? Is there engineering? Is there design? Is that customer success? Is that sales, marketing? Any of those sorts of things. Um, and that's going to be a little bit different depending on which type of group you're working on, but you're going to try and sort of keep that somewhat consistent across them. And you, again, I'm going to just harp on this. It's going to change. Like, it, yeah, you, you'll, you'll try something and like, ah, this doesn't work or it had too much dependencies on this or we we're using consultants or anything like that. Like, try something now. When it doesn't work in six months, you know how to make it better. Right. We'll check back in on Tiger Teams at the end of Q3 and see how they went. <laughs> um, perfect. So I want to shift focus here a little bit to um, talking about startups and growth pains. We've chatted about it a little bit. We're going through a lot of them here. You've been through a lot of them as well. So from looking from the outside in, it seems like you have been very successful and had a ton of success. So congratulations to you. Your career is impressive. That's why you're here. Um, can you talk about some times where you've failed, where you felt like you'd really messed up, um, screwed something up, caused a dumpster fire, as I would like to say, uh, and what you learned from that, maybe what you would do differently, or, or I guess how you managed that situation? Um, 
No, I can never talk about my failures. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what that would look like. Uh, obviously, obviously getting, um, I, I mean, most of what I do on a day-to-day basis is fail by, by the definition. And I feel like we, um, we hold that in a sort of negative regard and we don't want to talk about those things. But the reality is that you don't learn anything by succeeding because you can succeed for any number of reasons that are not the reasons you think. It's actually the lessons are all in the failures. The like getting better at something that we've already talked about a couple of times now is all in trying something, figuring out why it was broken and then learning based on that. Um, So uh, it's nice of you to say that uh, my career looks like that, but that's like the Instagram effect, right? Like of course it it looks good on a resume because I'm trying to sell myself. Like that's 100% it like, most of the time is trying things and uh, and failing. Uh, right now, so we're we're at the four person uh, startup phase, and we are we are pre product market fit uh, in terms of phase. If, if you're not familiar with that, that's a like we have an idea, we think it's right, and the customers disagree with us. So that's a pretty uh, like fundamental issue in terms of running a successful business. And the like process by which you find product market fit is a lot of okay well that didn't work let's try this let's try it with a bunch of people so that we get enough signal like oh that worked for this company that looked like this but not any of these other ones that we actually wanted to sell to and it's that over and over and over again um so i think like you know one of the things that i've learned from that series of failures and and we kind of talked a little bit about like startup growing pains is inside every company, every one of your competitors, every one of the like the Googles or the big name tech companies, they are all dealing with their own shit right now. And it's doesn't, it's not like it's just smooth sailing and they're crushing it there. Everybody in that company is also dealing with the same stuff that you're dealing with. Different scale, different, slightly different set of problems, but day to day, it's still a like, ah, God, I really didn't like deliver on that presentation that I needed to, or I, this person's like trying to weasel me out of my job like all that's all that sort of crap is true at every company um and one of the best things you can do especially right now when you're in like the the deep fire this is the best tv it's just continuing to pay dividends um it's just get really good at like being zen through that experience like just be okay sort of being a monk in the, the hurricane i think we have that like gif of the dog in the dumpster fire that we throw out there all too often it, it really does seem like be, dumpster fire be the dumpster is a, fire a dog. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that makes total sense um we did chat a little bit earlier about culture and you mentioned um <clears throat> having values sticking to those values is something that definitely helps um as a product team and a design team we've tried to create principles that kind of help drive that culture forward too but um one of the questions that was submitted to us is pretty straightforward. It's, is it possible to keep the culture alive of your business while you scale? Yeah, I, and, and in fact, that's probably the only thing that you do is scaling business. It's it's just that. Like, uh, if you are going to go from 130 to 1300, your job as the 10% that are aware of this now and are scaling it is just to, like, these are the things that we figured out that help make us successful. We're gonna tell a bunch of other people about that so we can be more successful. It's it's absolutely that way. There's definitely, like, things that you need to be cognizant of. You guys are in a, uh, you know, somewhat unique experience relative to your scale with a split office in Toronto. And so, like, making sure that there's good sort of cultural culture sharing and envoys going back and forth is is important um but like building that into your process is something that you're already aware of so yeah i'm it, it's absolutely possible i think there's things that do go away as you scale like you at some point you're not going to know everybody's name and that sucks like that that doesn't feel like as much of a family but like try and tell all those people that you are meeting that are coming in the door like this is what we're about and this is what got us here this is why i'm excited to be here Yeah, I think that was, or those are some of the comments that I've heard from people here at the organization. It's that culture doesn't really scale and it will change and shift as you grow. And maybe it'll change for the better, but it seems as though there's some core fundamental things in your opinion that we can hold on to and keep and fight really hard to maintain as an organization. There's, there is a, there's a little bit of a, there's a right personality for a right size of company. 
and the the just like true reality is that sometimes there's some people who are set up for like no i loved it when it was 10 people and two pizzas like that's that was my uh that was my my favorite fit and that's that's fine like not everybody has the i want to see a company from there to you know 10,000 that's okay um but that's more of an individual thing. I think the, the the culture for a company can absolutely and should absolutely be just focused and scaling. Turned it off. No, we're done, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wrap it up. We're done here. <laughs> um, so, how did you work to build or maintain that good culture at Dropbox? And... You mentioned they had a bit of a bro-y culture and there were some things that maybe came from the culture before that you maybe didn't even value or maybe you did value, but as you grew, you felt that there were some things that you wanted to remove from that culture. Um, was that something that happened naturally or as a company, was it something that you had to take steps or, or work at to change or adjust as you grew? No, it was, it's, it's it's working at it. It's, it's like uh, going to company scale therapy, right? Like you have to like be open to that conversation and uh, be open to critical feedback like it's it's not things... radical candor yeah it, it okay. absolutely like it's 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 very easy especially you know if you've been here for a while if you have new people coming in and they're like oh you know this this thing that we do here actually doesn't work really well to feel that is like a personal attack and it's it's not it's they're coming in with the benefit of fresh eyes to an organization that is potentially vastly different than it was when you started and they have totally valid uh, reasonable feedback um so I, like in as much as you can not take that as a like an attack and a slight and be open to that foster that uh that sort of value of radical candor having uh, opportunities to collect that feedback in a number of different avenues and also like don't just pay a lip service like actually spend some time trying to figure out okay yeah we've heard this from a couple, couple of different angles what can we do what can we do to approach fix um, address and that might be again as I mentioned at the beginning like you may choose to do some things that uh, have negative results and that's okay that like uh, not everything is going to be positive they're, they're, everything is a trade-off so if you've decided that that is the right trade-off to make for your organization that's fine just be conscientious about like that is the trade-off that we're making we've reasonably argued both sides this is the one that we choose perfect so let's shift focus again quickly here too. Uh, we'll open up the floor for a few questions before we wrap up. But uh, one of the things that came up through our survey uh, was a lot of questions about product-led growth and pricing. And uh, we've been spending a lot of time here as a company trying to evaluate how we create a culture of product-led growth and how we make our product grow itself more easily and <laughs> scale on its own. So. Uh, what are your thoughts on the term product-led growth and what is your experience in fostering that culture in the organizations that you've worked with? Um, I've benefited from the fact that like almost by definition, both of the big companies I've worked at were product-led companies. Um, in many ways, Dropbox's journey the time I was there was trying to figure out how to not only do product-led growth. Like it, the, the company itself was really built around this, hey, it's a great product. You can use it, you can give it to your parents, they can use it, they know how to use it. Um, that's great, start paying us. And that, that was the extent of our like product marketing for a number of years at the company. That's it. It's a totally valid strategy. Um, and in fact, like honestly, one of the ones that if you look at sort of what investors are investing in right now, they are more interested in products where a user can walk up to it start using it without having to sort of go through a sales call first. Now that's like, I benefited from the fact that those products had sort of come in through that world. And it sounds like you're going through a little bit more of a, hey, culturally, we have to figure out where this fits into our strategy. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's fair. It's, it's um, adjusting what is important at a company is really tough. Um, so uh, I talked about this a little bit this morning. Um, so you know Dropbox. There's also another competitor out there called Box, which does ostensibly the exact same thing. And 
Uh, they were actually, they got started about two, three years before Dropbox. Um, but the entire dis difference between the company is that Box was selling to like the General Electrics of the world, the giant enterprise companies. And we were sort of selling uh, quotes to moms and dads, uh, to, to anybody. A lot of my time at Dropbox was trying to figure out like, how do we sell Dropbox to General Electric? And we struggled with that. I think argue, you could argue that we still haven't figured that out as a company. Um, they're, they're making progress. Certainly like we benefit from the fact that we have sort of the brand awareness as a result, but um, making that pivot, if it's a big pivot away, is tough. And so, I mean, I, I think it just comes back to a lot of the stuff that we talked about in terms of culture, that uh, being really upfront, being transparent about what the goals are, why this is, what, what success looks like, why this is important to the company, is the way you can do that. And 12 months time, there's gonna be a whole bunch more people who are only gonna know that as a strategy. Um, but yes, it's, man, it's definitely a good one. Makes sense. We've definitely uh, taken that try and fail hard and fix things quickly approach here too. So <laughs> nice to hear you kind of confirm that sentiment. Um, so I want to stop talking, but hoping that you're open to taking a few questions from people in the audience and kind of see what they would like to know. Um, we had a whole bunch of additional or general questions from people, but um, we've covered some of them. So if we could open up the floor to a few questions, if anyone would like to ask anything or want to know anything, then yeah, good yeah, to happy to take any questions. Allie, I don't know if I can reach you. No, I'm here you. Okay. Um, you talked about trade-offs a lot, uh, and I think that they're a theme that kind of are continual in this world, and that's a good thing. Um, I've also experienced, you know, maybe things are changing really quickly, and there's scale going on, and you make a lot of decisions and a lot of trade-offs, and you look back six weeks later, and everybody's like, why did we choose that one? Um, have you had any, like, is that okay, or do you have any tools for mitigating that? Um, so I do think, and I thank you for asking this question. Um, part of the part of the successful part of that planning process you were referencing. Um, uh, so just to recap, what we would do is part of this sort of phase decision making process is talk about what is the problem, what would it look like to solve it, what are potential solutions so we can actually evaluate, you know, not just the one solution that came to somebody's mind, but like the, the options, and then like. How are we going to implement that? Uh, what does it look like? That sort of thing. And part of the benefit of that is that because we are upfront of uh, what is this problem? Why is it important to solve? What does success look like in terms of metrics? We captured that. And it did allow us to go back and say like, well, why did we do that? Why was this important at that time? And absolutely with the, like, the addition of even six weeks time, you have more information and that might be the wrong decision now. But that part of the reason you want to make a decision and move fast is so you can get to that learning six weeks later. It's always better to make the bad decision than no decision. Um, that being said, it requires you to be pretty diligent and actually go back. And I think, honestly, this is one of the hardest parts of any organization, which is like kind of holding your own feet to the fire and going back and being like, oh yeah, this is why we didn't take the right thing into consideration or we didn't have this piece of information or it wasn't as important as we thought. And that's because there's, there is a lot of like, you know, your, your ego associated with it. Not, 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 not like that was my decision. Just so like it, it hurts to go back and look at you and be self-critical about, Oh, I did, did make this choice, even though that wasn't the right choice. And you only know that six months down the line or six weeks down the line. So I, if you can be, kind of directed in your call it post-mortem it doesn't need to be as sort of like formal as that but just a how did we do what could have been better and again not take that personally but use it as a way to sort of inform your process that's great um i will say that there are very few companies that do that really really well but i think that is tremendously valuable if you can Uh, you mentioned that Dropbox was a little bit more including inclusive of design throughout the product process. So how did you as a product manager include design throughout the process more? And how did you kind of cultivate the environment 
as a company to include design throughout the whole process. Sure, yeah, and it actually, so frankly, that was a big shift for me because I was coming from Google, which was a very like engineering-led organization and design was in some senses uh, kind of an afterthought, um, at, at least, you know, 10 years ago when I was there now. Oh God. Um, it, so part of it is it came top down. Like it was, it was culturally important for the founders that design be absolutely considered from the beginning of the process. And so with that kind of pretty clear feedback from them, uh, from our product management team perspective, what we did was try and figure out like, okay, what in other product management roles would I do at a separate company that actually should be in the hand of design and how do I incorporate that in part of the process? And so um, I, it showed up in a number of different ways, like decide, the, the organization of the sort of tiger teams, you call them. So like having a designer uh, associated with each team, like a dedicated resource, as opposed to like, you know, uh, a center of excellence to use some Toyota buzzword or something. Um, like having somebody actually dedicated and committed to that, as opposed to it being, you know, 20% of their day really helped. Having them uh, committed to that from the inception of what is the end user pain here? What are we actually trying to solve? Um, why is that important for the company? And how does that sort of reflect not just from a visual st design standpoint, but from like a usability, where does this fit into the rest of the product and sort of having design own that um, all the way through the process, not just at the beginning, but all the way through the process uh, was really important as well. And I think honestly, it ended up requiring us to have designers that were both willing to kind of take on a, a little bit more than they had at other companies because they were becoming more of like a, a product owner. It also required um, PMs that had empathy for design as a practice in the way that um, over the last 10 years, PMs have really been set up to have empathy with engineers. They also needed to have that with designers. And um, we had to start hiring for that, that, that it was part of our, our interview process. We had to like build with that as an expectation, even from the day you come in to see if you want to work in Dropbox. Um, but we were able to get there. And I think now if you look at Dropbox as a sort of, at, at least from the, the lens of a design team, like it's one of the best in the Valley as a result of that. How do you hire for empathy? Woof. Um, yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, great question. So, um, short answer is I don't know. And uh, the longer answer is I'll try and give you a couple of ways that we've attempted to. Um, so, uh, Google was pretty, um, they get a lot of credit for creating. Uh, what we understand product management to be now in terms of a role. Um, and they had product managers, this was back in, I think like 2004, uh, 2003. Uh, they had product managers, they were mostly MBAs. If you have an MBA, just plug your ears for the next like 30 seconds. Um, and they did, the MBAs did a really bad job at Google. And, and that was a function of the fact that they couldn't speak engineering. So uh, because engineering was so important culturally, uh, they had these teams that would just butt heads as opposed to actually working collaboratively. And so um, actually, it was, they, they fired all the PMs and they started hiring uh, CS new grads uh, and teaching them to be product managers. And the reason they did that was they knew that if you had written code, if you had built product, you would have empathy to other engineers, even if you weren't in that role. Like you could respect that. So they they cheated. They 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 like made that a hard requirement. Like, oh, you have to be an engineer to be a product manager, so that you'll have empathy with engineers. We didn't do that with our design uh, team at Dropbox. Um, we definitely had some interview questions uh, where they would actually like hang out and do design pro like half day design projects with designers um, and you're you're you are trying to be a designer but 
frankly, for the most part, the product managers are, were not designers unless they had explicitly made that shift in the past. Now, we were lucky to find a couple of those, but again, I think the answer is I'm not sure. <laughs> but that's what we found. We cheated. I think we have time for one more question. If anyone over here has one. No, quiet group. Oh, we have one. Oh, where? <laughs> I, th I think you were pointing at each other now? I'm like, ah! <laughs> How did that happen? So this is more of like a personal question to you. Um, so you're obviously like a really delightful person to be around. Um, but <laughs> I think it's your facial structure because when your face is like just sitting there, you look like you're smiling. But, um, but you've been in companies of like thousands of employees and then you go down to a company that's like four people. And then in the in-between, you're in a company of like a hundred. I'm just curious, you know, you talked about like being Zen throughout that process. Personally and professionally, is that a conscious decision that you've made over like the last decade to 15 years in how to deal with that change and how to like wake up every day with intention of setting that culture or is it just your personality? Um, no, I think that's... Uh, huh. This is an interesting question. Um, it's definitely something that I've learned intentionally as I've gotten older um, through a combination of like you know, being through the shit and watching it like work out in the way that it would work out regardless of like, you know, what I did. Um, and you know, some amount of like uh, therapy and some amount of just like being in normal adult relationships, right? Like it, it's, it's sort of the thing that you're describing, I think, uh, is really more of a like, this is how you be a better human as opposed to this is how you be a successful startup founder. Um, they just happen to like, in a lot of ways, running a company or is sort of similar to being married or having kids. I assume, I don't know. I'm, I'm not an expert. So like, yeah, that's, like, that's, that's my, my theory. Uh, don't challenge me on that. But it's, it is a lot of like, it's, it's communication and talking through the hard stuff and not shying away from like, look, this isn't working, let's figure out how we do. Um, I think that's, I've gotten better at that over time. I have a lot of room to improve still, um, but it has been a conscious choice for me to like try and get better at it. And I think it's helped me not just on the tech side, but I think it's helped me in a lot of life. Good question to end on. I like that a lot, thank you. Well, we wanna thank you for coming here. So we have a, a little present for you too. Ooh, socks. Socks and a hoodie. <laughs> Seven socks, right? Oh, these are great. Thank so, you. So uh, <laughs> we'll expect a little selfie with you wearing them one day. Send it over to us. I can, I can change these right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's seriously, no, I, I, I know I jumped into this at the start. Like, uh, I, before I moved to um, San Francisco, I did four months at Vendasta in 2008. And it was kind of like, it was neat at the time to see like, a, you know, 12 people in a room, like writing Python in, in Saskatoon. That was like a rare and experience for me. And I wasn't expecting it even at the time to like see this group nerding out about product management in Saskatoon now make like deeply warms my heart. So I'm, I'm really excited to see all of you here. All right, well, come back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>